<laughs> Folks, I've been a tour guide in the Smokies for 43 years where you get on these big chartered buses and you're the guide. I think I inherited my love of the mountains from my father. My family came into the Smokies around 1802 and I'm the first generation that has never lived in what's now the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. This is a picture of my family when uh, it was made around 1928 and that little boy standing down front between the men's knees is my father. He's gone now, but if he were with us, he'd be about 95 years old. I was showing this to someone. I said, don't they look, uh, he worked for the park. He was a historian. I said, don't they look pitiful? They look a little bit like the Beverly Hillbillies. He said, no, Ruth. He said, look at it. He said, your grandpa has a store-bought suit, a store-bought hat. Said the little girls have dresses that probably your grandmother made out of flower sacks. Do any of you remember flower sacks? You know, I looked at it real, real close. I think she bought this material, if you look at it close. I think it came from Ogle's store down in Gatlinburg. She ended up having nine children and 54 grandkids. I'm number 17 in the birth order. So I was never really close to my grandmother. I, after you got 16 grandkids, you're not excited about number 17, which was me. So I, I wasn't really close to her. But she told me stories. Once I fell in love with those mountains, the stories she told me. And then as we were getting ready to leave one day, they lived, if you go up the mountain, where that pull-off says Campbell Overlook, they lived down off the bank there. And that's why I call living down in the holler. Have you ever heard that holler? You may say hollows where you come from, but it's always been hollers. But anyway, they lived below the road and they moved down to the what's now the park in 1932. But as we were ready to go home, the last time I was ever with my grandmother, I said, Grandma, tell me stories about people that lived here. She said, why Ruth, there's still an old man that lives here. She says he's a beekeeper out on Jake's Creek. If you don't know where Jake's Creek is, you might know where Elkmont is. Out in that section is where Uncle Lim Ornby lived. Lim Ornby. His name was really Lemuel after the, out of the Bible. That was a king, but everybody called him Uncle Lim. Well, after she told me about him, I'd drive out and knock on the old man's door. He'd come shuffling over because she seen he was blind. And he'd holler, yep, what do you want? And I'd tell him I wanted to buy some of that honey. Of course, he would, he would really, he'd answer my questions, but he didn't carry on a conversation with me. One day I went to visit my grandpa Watson, who is related to that guy. <laughs> We're all related. <laughs> but anyway, as we went over to Uncle Lim's and uh, my grandpa, I asked him, I said, because he'd been a lumberman in the mountains, my grandfather, Arthur Watson. I said, did you happen to ever meet Uncle Lim on me? He said, why, well, Ruth, he's my first cousin. I said, well, why don't we go there someday and visit? It was on a Sunday in October of 1983. We drove over. He said, let's just go today. Knocked on the door, and the old man didn't come to the door. But in a few minutes, here he come walking around the house. And he hollered, yep, what do you want? He always answered the door that way. And my grandpa told him who he was, and he took my grandpa's hand and said, oh, Arthur, come in. He says, I only have two first cousins still alive, you and a fellow in Virginia. So we walked into that old man's cabin. It was a four-room four room house. Of course, his living room had two old iron beds on the right side, on the left side was an old pot belly stove with a mantle over it, and there was a photograph of his grandfather in his Civil War uni Union, Civil War uniform. That was my grandfather's great-grandfather. What to see? 
And we sat down and started talking to that old man. And as we sat there, I said, well, Uncle Lim, do you have a lot of, how many children do you have? He said, why, Mimey, he got married when he was 39 and Mommy, Mimey was 39 also. She, he said, she always told folks we never had, we just never did buy any kids. Said we just didn't buy any. Of course, they never had any children. But as I kept talking to him, I said, well, Uncle Liam, have you done a lot of traveling? He said, oh, yeah. He said, I went to the top of the mountain one time and dragged a dog with a guy from North Carolina. He was talking about Newfound Gap. He said, I've been into Knoxville several times. That's all he ever said. I don't think he'd been anywhere. But as we said, and after a while he said to me, he says, you see how smooth my skin is? And I looked at that old man that his skin was kind of smooth. He was 92 years old and he worked outside all the time. He said, I tell you what, he said, if you'll eat honey every day, you'll have nice skin. Well, let me tell you, I've been eating honey for 30 years now, putting it in my iced tea or putting it on a biscuit. My mama said to me a few years ago, she said, Ruth, I don't know what that honey's doing to your skin, but she says, I tell you what, those biscuits sure are putting it on. You know what that means, don't you? <laughs> putting it on. Oh, well. But and we kept talking to him, and as I realized he hadn't gone anywhere, I thought, people that come to the Smokies, if they know about him, a lot of people would find out about him. They go out and visit. He saw the world. He saw the Statue of Liberty. He saw parents. He saw the ocean through their stories. He saw it. You could tell that. As we got ready to go that day, that old man stood up and he took my grandpa's hand. He said, Arthur, if I don't see you anymore, he says, I'm going to see you in heaven. That's the last time we ever saw him. That February he passed away. He lived, I'm going to say, over in the holler. You know, the most famous person that ever lived in the holler was Dolly Parton. She lived a mile away from where we lived. We lived across the river from her great grandmother. But I want to tell you today, I live up the holler. And it's the holler that that grandparents came to, kind of out in Pittman Center. And I've been there for about 25 years. My dad bought it from his mother and it kind of got broke up and my mama hated it. We didn't have any electricity, no indoor plumbing and no indoor water. If we wanted water, we ran down to the spring and got it. But that's where I live. My house is over 100 years old. If you were to come visit and we were in the living room and put an egg down, it'd just roll right on out my front door. It's a wonderful place. You know, I have two nephews, and every time they would go on vacation, they would call me up and say, Aunt Ruth, will you keep our dog while we're gone? I said, sure. They never came back to get him. Uh, they, they just left him. And I already had two dogs. And, and then I had three because of my nephew. And one day I was standing on my porch and I looked down in the ditch and there was something laying down there. And it was an old hound dog. It was folded up just like an envelope or something. And I walked down there. That old dog was just shivering and I went and got it some food and water. And it finally I, it got up and it looked like someone beat it to death. It had knots on its head and tumors on its belly. It was ugly. And I did not need another dog. Uh, so I thought, I'm going to call the dog catcher. And by the way, my address is 3873 Heaven's View Lane. And I, there's no houses around me. I'm just out there on that what used to be a farm. It's not a farm anymore. But that old dog looked like this one in the middle. It was a walker hound. You know, when they got up on their hind legs, they were about six feet tall. Well, old dog, 
I kept feeding him. I called the dog catcher, and he said, Ruth, can you catch that dog? I said, no, it's wild. I don't know whose it is. or No, I can't catch it. He said, when I get a live trap, I'll come get it. I said, okay. About six months went by, and I was thinking, I don't need another dog. There's four here now, and I called him old dog because I didn't want to get attached. Well, I called the dog catcher. He said, Ruth, I don't have a live trap right now, but when I get one, I'll come get him. I said, okay. About, I don't know how much time went by, but I thought, I'm going to take this dog to the, the vet and get shot. Well, I took it to the vet. I had a new car, and I put a towels down because I thought, old dog's probably never rode in a car. Sure enough, old dog had me. He laid his head on my shoulder. He was in the back seat. Got a little sick. And I took him in, and the doctor gave me rabies shot. He came out, and he said, Ruth, the dog has heartworms. He said, now, I can give this dog a high-powered shot. See, it'll cost six hundred dollars. You'll only have to have one. I said, "Well, okay, six hundred dollars." He gave the dog the shot. I took him home, and the vet had said, "Now, Ruth, you cannot let this dog run loose because his heart will be weakened from this shot. It, it was really strong." He said, "Do you need to put this dog in a pen?" Well, I didn't have a pen. So I built one. It cost me four hundred dollars, thousand dollars. That's my thousand dollar dog. Well, time went by, and I kept petting, saying, "Old oh, dog, you're going to heaven," because I knew when the dog catcher came, nobody would want that dog. It was ugly. I th called it old dog, but it'd been in a pen probably for years. Its teeth were worn away. The vet said it's not that old, Ruth. Well. One day I was petting him and I thought, old dog, I'm going to go call the dog catcher. I was petting him until he was going to heaven. And then I realized, I live on heaven's way. That old dog became my dog. I fell madly in love with him. He was some dog. I, that's all I prepared to tell you. I, I didn't time what I was doing. So I, you're short about three minutes. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Let's discuss recording your stories and preserving your old family photos here at the Maples History Center. We're on the third floor of the King Family Library in downtown Sevierville.